Dear friends, I normally start my speeches these days by acknowledging my nervousness because sometimes when I speak, people ask me the question, have you heard of Martin Luther King? And whether I know what his most famous speech was called. And I respond in a gentle voice, I have a dream. And they shout back at me, yes, it's I have a dream. But when we hear you speak, it sounds like you have a nightmare. <laughs> the forests are are disappearing, the oceans are rising, inequality is on the rise, and so on. Herein lies one of the greatest challenges to our well-being right now. How do we speak truth to power on the one hand, but how do we do it in a way that does not demotivate, depress, and demobilize people? Today, though, sorry, sorry, please don't clap. I got a very strict time limit. They've given me 10 minutes. <laughs> Today, though, inspired by Luisa's vulnerability from the opening plenary, I'm going to follow her example, so I'm even more nervous. Oh, and for those of you who have not figured it out, I'm the kumi that she referred to in her speech. I experienced my first trauma at the age of seven when I lost my baby brother. My mom, partly as a result, of not receiving any support for the loss and problems in a marriage would take her own life at the age of 38 when I was 15. My eldest sister Kay was 19. And when you're 15, 19 is very, very old. <laughs> and she stepped into the role with amazing generosity and love in the absence of my mom. At the time of my mother's death, I was al already becoming politically active against the apartheid system. An older activist said to me, I don't know how you recover from this, my son, but one thing that might help you is if you live your life with purpose and always seek to stand for justice and dignity for all people. I guarantee you, whatever pain you are feeling, there are people in our country and there are people in the world that are suffering so much more. I took this seriously, and my mom's death accelerated my involvement in the liberation struggle. I was expelled from school the following year for my efforts, a trauma in itself, since far too many people said, your mom must be turning in a grave from watching you sacrifice your education. For the next three and a half decades, I tried to live with purpose, and found it easy to stay focused on various struggles for justice, even though the world of privilege had become accessible to me after the Rhodes Scholarship Selection Committee in South Africa somehow made an error and gave me a scholarship to go to Oxford. In 2017, I was headhunted by Amnesty International for the role of Secretary General. I interviewed for the position on 17 December 2017. As I was going into the interview, my niece called me to say my sister Kay had been diagnosed with brain cancer. I was at her bedside 34 days later when she left us at the age of 56. I was completely broken at the loss of my sister, but the fact that I had not dealt with my mother's suicide resulted in the scab around her death being broken, and it felt as if I had lost my mom and my sister together. The only treatment I got at the time of my mother's death was being given sedatives and strong sleeping tablets. As when my mom died, I was placed in a situation where I had to be strong for my siblings and nephews and niece now. Before my sister passed, Amnesty International had already announced the appointment. The possibility that I should have paused and said I cannot take on such a heavy burden after such a massive loss just did not occur to me. Instead, instead together with my nephew, my sister's elder son, and Louisa, we poured our grief into supporting the Nelson Mandela Foundation in a climb up Kilimanjaro such that we would summit on Nelson Mandela's 100th birthday. I'd already realized Amnesty International was going through immense trauma as a result 
of a respected senior colleague having taken his life in the amnesty office, saying in his suicide note that the organizational culture and the lack of support had led him to take this decision. This was followed by a young intern also taking a life, two weeks later. Given that my mom's suicide was now resurrected as a result of my sister's death, instead of seeing this as a moment of pause, I saw it as, okay, I figured I know about suicide and I can help Amnesty come out of this. After I joined, I effectively had to do two full-time jobs. Doing the external representation, which should have been the main and primary thing that I would do in that role, but given that the previous management's credibility was, I would say, unfairly challenged, I had to do a considerable amount of the internal work that was needing to be done, including addressing the well-being of colleagues with an amnesty. But the most painful thing that I had to do was to work with the two families to help them heal from the horrific loss they had suffered. People seemed to have judged that I had done well, in this responsibility, with some even saying that my own personal suicide history had helped me deal with it with maximum empathy and sensitivity. Once again, I totally underestimated the toll this was having on me. Of course, working on human rights at a time when we were suffering serious setbacks, the rise of fascism in the United States and Europe and elsewhere, also added to the stress. Seeing suffering with one's own eyes or having to deal with it on a daily basis, not just for me, but for all my colleagues at Amnesty, is something, and, and, and people working in other organizations, we have not done really well at addressing. We have underestimated the impact of secondary trauma, and this has had lots of consequences. A few months into the job, I visited Iraq and Syria as part of getting the US and the UK governments to take responsibility for the massive loss of civilian lives as a result of indiscriminate bombings. The only thing different with what's happening in Ukraine right now is that we're having multiple Rakars and multiple cities. But just to be clear, the UK, US and NATO also carry complicity of exactly the same kind of behavior. I had to visit a mass grave in Raqqa, where bodies were being carefully exhumed by volunteers. Volunteers. Nobody paid them. Not the UK government, not the US government, who were in control of Raqqa at that time. One of the bodies was of a woman who was the height of my sister. We knew it was a woman because of her long hair, since hair apparently takes longer to decompose compared to human flesh. I was completely devastated. But I was leading a four-person delegation in one of the most unsafe places in the world. I had to be strong. In fact, the head of the Raqqa government who met with us when I walked in, she said, oh, I thought the head of Amnesty International would come with 12 security guards. It was their way of saying, don't overplay your role. While you're here, we are following you, we got you under control. Soon the pressures of dealing with the trauma of the suicides within Amnesty my sister's recent death, the resurrection of my mom's suicide, the fact that I had taken on huge responsibility for internal processes at Amnesty meant that I was working 20-hour days and I was on a perpetual sleep deficit. This took a toll on me and my hypertension, which I had dealt with after preparing for Kilimanjaro. When I came down Kilimanjaro, I was the healthiest I'd ever been in my adult life. Medication failed to control it, and eventually friends back home said I was being irresponsible. And I quote, you're going to have a stroke or be dead in months at the way you are carrying on. The responsible thing for you to do is to stop, recalibrate your life, deal with the trauma you have not dealt with, then maybe you can contribute for another decade or so. Put in these words, which were telling me I was being politically and socially irresponsible, gave me the courage to make one of the bravest decisions I ever made, offering my resignation to what is seen by some, especially in the global north, as one of the most important positions in civil society. I then started a process of healing. Everything 
from learning to breathe again, <laughs> doing breath work, which I didn't know it, such a thing existed. I think a lot of people here yeah, know about breath work. I just discovered it a couple of years ago. Meditating for the first time, doing yoga while I was stuck alone in London during lockdown, and waking up Louisa through Zoom so she would join me in those one-hour yoga sessions because she knows more about yoga than I do. An important part of this healing process was also seeking non-Western indigenous forms of healing, which colonialism unsuccessfully tried to wipe out and working with mainstream healing work. Sorry, it's only three minutes left. <laughs> uh, with non-mainstream healing work that draws on ancient wisdoms and indigenous knowledge. The most important part of my healing process was writing a letter to my mother, telling her what happened in my childhood years since she has passed, decades since she had passed. The process of the writing was painful, and for the first time I really cried for my mom's loss every time I sat down to write during lockdown. On the morning of 23rd February this year, when Louisa called me to say that our son Ricardo had committed suicide, just after a week when he called me to share things that were troubling him, None of what was troubling him was private. Everything was in the public domain. It was about the needless loss of life he was seeing around him in our own country, the corruption, the inequality, the concerns around uh, the environment and running out of time on climate change. He also, in this conversation, insisted that he wanted to thank me for things I had done to support him before he had become successful and famous. I called Louisa later the day to tell her how we had spoken for 90 minutes and even though it started out sad, we ended up laughing when, because he insisted on his going through his list of things to thank me, at the end I said, actually, since you insisted, you forgot one important thing from the list. And then he said, yeah, I'm sorry for completely writing off and smashing your car and thank you for, for not being too freaked out about it. And he promised to come and visit me with the family during the Easter holidays, with the family in Berlin, where I was based on a fellowship at that time. The gentle and caring manner in which Louisa broke the news added to my desperate sense of guilt. How could I have not figured out that was Ricardo's last call? How could I have been so stupid? Why would he be thanking me for all of these things out of the blue? I can say safely that I would not have survived if it were not for the internal work I did since my resignation from Amnesty International. So to conclude, what is my sense of the activist who said to me when my mother died, live with purpose and things might be okay? He was right. I strongly believe that the core of that advice was correct. And I'm grateful to him for that advice. However, it lacked an important ingredient. He should have added that I do not have to be apologetic about taking care of my well-being. I hope to continue my activism in big part through the Ricky Rick Foundation for the Promotion of Artivism, but I will no longer be ashamed or apologetic for taking care of my own well-being. When I was fleeing South Africa into exile at the age of 22, my best friend Lenny Naidu asked me a question. What is the biggest contribution we can make to the cause of humanity? What is the biggest contribution we can make to the cause of humanity? Giving our life, I replied. He said, you mean going, getting shot and killed and becoming a martyr? I said, I guess so. Sadly, that conversation was the last I had with Lenny since he was murdered two years later by the apartheid regime. What he was saying is that the struggle for justice is a marathon, not a sprint. And we must stay the course and take care of our well-being along the way and understand it is not only a personal responsibility, but it is also a social responsibility for activists and others who are acting in the public interest. This time you can clap. We, okay, not so much. We have tough times ahead. 
Our well-being will be challenged like never before. It will take us resisting the cognitive dissonance of those in power, turbocharging intersectionality, recognizing that the worst disease humanity faces is not COVID, but a disease we can call affluenza, and embracing what Martin Luther King called when he called for creative maladjustment and therefore not conforming to a badly broken status quo. And to Louisa, thank you for the courage on Wednesday and for inspiring me to have the courage to share what I did today. Muchas gracias, merci buku, asante sana, kiabonga kakulu, shukran. Thank you very, very much for your kind attention. Thank you.